Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started again. I'm, I'm happy that everybody came back. I really, you know, people start taking their bags for a coffee break. I'm like, yeah. Okay, so, um, so what we're going to talk about uh, for the rest of um, uh, the session is, okay, well, it's nice that we can create this for our data set, but we're probably going to want to do different things and maybe include that in resampling. So, like, how would you use this in practice? So this is where a lot of the per stuff comes in. And again, just to emphasize, this is not the final API. This is like, so what we want to do is we want to have higher level APIs that will, like, have sensible defaults and, and kind of be like, okay, if you want a minimal amount of code to run, like, it'll do this for you. But that's not available yet. Um, and so um, what this is, but the, the thing is, we don't want to make it overly difficult if you want to do something that we can't implement. So, um, so the stuff that is here is like the interface that you would use um, if you want to just do it all yourself, because right now that's the option. Um, and I don't think it's terribly bad, especially if you've used like um, Model R or um, <clears throat> Dplyr and some other things. So it's going to be very per heavy. All right. So let's just to define terms, let's talk about cross-validation, because that's the resampling method I'll use. Um, basically what it comes down to is, um, if you use basically v-fold cross-validation, um, v is usually like 5 or 10, and what you would do is you would randomly split your data into, you know, let's say 10, um, 10 equally sized groups randomly, and then um, and those are called the folds, the 10 folds. And so what you would do is you would have eventually 10 resamples, and a resample is just a separate realization kind of up your training set. Okay, so on the first fold, what you would do is you would take that first 10% that you randomly allocated, and then you would take that out, and that would be your assessment set. You would build a model on the remaining 90%, which is what I've been calling your analysis set. So let's say you build that linear model or something on that 90%, and then you predict the 10% that was held out. And on that 10% you held out, you calculate whatever measure of performance you want to use, like R squared or, I don't know, if you're doing classification, like area of the RC curve, or whatever you want to calculate, that's what you do on that, those predictions in your assessment set. And the critical thing there is none of the data points were used for both modeling and assessment, okay? So at the end of that first fold, you have, you know, a set of estimates of performance, like root mean squared error and R squared or whatever. Um, so you take that, that first fold, you put it back in the pot, and you take the second 10% out, the second fold. So you still have 90%, but it's a different, you know, mostly the same, but, but an overall different 90%. You fit a model on that, you predict the 10% you held out that time, the second fold. And then you get another estimate of, let's say, R squared. So then you have two different estimates of R squared. And then you just round robin and go through that. You end up doing that for the third fold all the way through the 10th. And at the end of that process, you have 10 different estimates of performance. So let's say it's R squared, although I don't really like R squared, but um, you have 10 different estimates of R squared. And it turns out that if you average those 10 estimates, those are actually a pretty good estimate of future performance on new data, right? So my, my experience is that people have argued about this, but it's overwhelmingly been my experience that your test set performance tends to correlate pretty well to the resampling estimate that you would get a performance. So if you take that model, predict your test set, and you get whatever R squared you get, that tends to be pretty close or, or pretty decently correlated with the resampling estimate of R squared, which is the average of those 10 R squareds you held out, okay? Now the thing that sometimes trip, trips people up about resampling is, they're like, wait, what happens to those 10 models? Is that like an ensemble? And it's like, no. The, we're throwing all those things away. The only thing resampling in this context is going to be used for is to estimate performance only on your training set data, right? Because we don't want to go to our test set until we really, really need to, because otherwise it's just part of the training process. So if we don't have a ton of data, we have to find some way to make comparisons between models or comparison between feature engineering procedures. So you know that, remember that first data set with the blue and the red circles, if I wanted to compare like using the ratio there versus using the first principal component versus using both and just uh, inverse transforming them, that's three different scenarios. And what I would do is I would do tenfold cross-validation on each of those and I'd get, let's say, you know, three overall R squareds for each approach. And that would let me say, oh, well, you know, it looks like ratio is the best way of doing that. And, and you can make those sort of comparisons between things without having to go to your test set. Because, again, and the more you go to your test set, it's not a test set anymore. It's, you know, it's just part of the modeling process. So you need something that can generate performance without contaminating that whole out set that you have. Any questions on that? Just as a, a little visual, 
Here's like 30 data points. And if I did 10-fold cross-validation, the first uh, column there would be fold one. The, um, that, that's not 30, that's 50 data points. Uh, the five dark blue would be the five holdouts that you would, you know, compute performance on. And then you, for the second fold, you put those back in and take out a different 5% and so on. And you can see the way 10-fold cross-validation works is none of the data points are used as a holdout in more than one fold. Okay, so that's a, it turns out that that's a nice property. There are many, many variations of, of resampling. There's bootstrapping, there's different variations of, of uh, cross-validation. I tend to use this, and, and you'll see sort of what I'll, ooh, I'm not plugged in. Um, and I'm not getting power. I'm gonna disappear, hold on. There we go, okay. Uh, 4%. Uh, so, um, so what I'll tend to do is, you know, for our data set here, there's about 2,200 data points in our training set. And I think about, here's the calculation I make, is I say, well, tenfold, I'd be leaving out about, my assessment set on average would be about 220. And let's say I'm computing root mean squared error. I think I can calculate a pretty decent root mean squared error on 220 data points. Especially I'm going to do that 10 times and average them. And, and that's very subjective and, and maybe not the most quantitative analysis. But that's how I tend to do it. Um, but let's say, let's say uh, holding out would leave 20 data points out. Okay, so if I had a tenth of the data I have now, then let's say my assessment set would be like 20 held out. I might not feel that great about it. I still like tenfold cross-validation procedure. So what I tend to do is I tend to do repeated cross-validation. Let's say I'll do five repeats of this, where I'll do the same process five times, and instead of averaging 10 things at the end, I'm averaging 50 things at the end. And, and it's like, it's a stereotypical statistician, right? So somebody brings you a data set and you can't find a difference, but they insist it's there. Like, what do I do? I'm like, collect more data, right? And so that's what we're doing is, it's all CPU cycles. So, you know, if you want more precise answers, then you can just do more resamples. Um, and so, but in this particular case, I think I have enough data to, um, to just do regular tenfold cross-validation and use that to compare models. Um, there's time series cross-validation. There's a bunch of different variations of this that are specific to like spatial data and all sorts of different things. So you don't always have to do this. And if you have a ton of data, then what I typically do is just hold back a certain percentage. Like, um, you know, if I have like, I, I, there's a data set I used to have to, that was continually updated. And we had like millions of data points, but we figured out that there was no use in doing anything but the work in the last 250,000. So we would just take like, you know, 50,000 data points as a single holdout, build our models on the 200,000, and then predict that. And, I, you know, that's enough precision I felt that, like, we're getting good results. So you don't even have to do multiple iterations if you have enough data. All right, so I kind of alluded to this earlier. You know, a bad thing to do would be to pre-process your data and then resample that. Because, again, the resampling doesn't know anything about um, operations that happened before, right? So let's say you're doing imputation. Um, it thinks that that data was never imputed. It just doesn't know about it. It's completely ignorant of that. And so it doesn't have any ability to, um, to capture the variation of imputation because it doesn't happen inside that resampling loop. Okay, so um, unless it's something, again, very, very simple, you know, I, I try to pressure people or at least set up software to do all that, all that estimation bits, whether it's the model or the pre-processing things, inside of the resampling loops. And, and so you might say, well, wait, I'm going to do like this recipe like 10 times. Yes, you are. Um, the same way you would build a model 10 times. Okay. So, uh, so let's look at our sample uh, for a little bit. So it's like a slight detour. Um, the way our sample works, you saw it uh, previously for um, creating a training and test set split, but I'm going to go to it a little bit more. There's a function called vfold CV that'll do a single or repeated cross-validation. By default, it does v equal 10 for one, um, one repeat, so it's not basically repeated. Um, you don't have to do this. I'm going to use a strata option, and again, what it does is it does the, the random sampling inside cross-validation and taking the outcome into account, or this variable into account. And the reason I do that is I don't want to um, have all the really expensive houses end up in one fold. And so the, the way we do this is we artificially create 
I think it's quantiles of your data. So it, it basically does a random split within the first 25%, the lowest 25% of your outcome. There's another random split in the, you know, the, the 25th to 50th percentile. And so you end up getting four different splits to create your folds and then it just combines them. So it's like a stratified resampling. Um, and there's been a lot of literature even back in like the 90s about this. That there's no real downside to doing that. Unless you have like pathologically small data, which is not what you should be doing here. Um, doing a stratified resample here is not problematic, even when your data is nice and symmetric. So, let's run this real quick and take a look at it in more detail. Um, so our sample is already loaded from before. So when I run it, um, I set the seed beforehand to, you know, so you get the same values. And if I just print this out, um, it's a tibble. The first column there is a, a list column of R split objects, and I'll tell you what that means in a second. And then the second column is an ID column that just is, you know, a little indicator for what fold we're looking at. Um, if I take one of these split columns, let's say I just take the first element of that split column and just print that out. I get something I, I kind of showed you earlier that it has three numbers. Here's the total data set that you started out with. Here's how much was held out in the assessment set, and here's how much was in the analysis set. Okay. And so um, if I do this for the second one, the numbers are slightly different. Oh, no, they're not the same. I know at least one of them is different. Come on. I know. Why doesn't he write a loop? I swear to God. Yes. Thank you. So. Um, so anyway, so you know, on average, it's about 222, but you know, you're not guaranteed, de depending on what that you know, number is. Um, if it were actually a straight 2200, I think that we would have gotten them all that way. But anyway, so, um, so, the, so Model R, like Hadley's Model R package, had this nice little trick to it where you know, we're creating 10 different versions of the data set. And that, that data is actually embedded in each one of these elements. And so you might think of like, oh great, you made 10 copies of the data, that's a bad idea. But it turns out that that's not actually what happens. Um, R is pretty smart about when it makes copies of things. And what we, what we do is actually we save the actual data set, we assign it to each one of these fold, one of these R set objects like this one, and, and we save it intact. We don't do anything to it. And then along that, we saved which data, in, you know, like we have it indicators, uh, integers, which rows belong in the analysis set and which rows don't. And so in doing that, um, having 10 different copies of that data object does not actually copy them in memory. We have 10 different symbols that point to the same original data set. And as soon as we add anything to it or do any operation that modifies it, now we have a copy that's in memory. But it's kind of a nice thing, like if you're doing bootstrapping, you have a big data set, you might want to do like 2,000 bootstraps. And you can do that with our sample without creating like a huge, you know, 2,000 fold memory allocation. So it's kind of smart about that stuff. So, but when we work with this stuff, the nomenclature I used before about analysis and um, assessment is we have um, functions that basically give you those back. Whoa. Yeah, I did that wrong. We want to use this, the first. Yeah. So, um, you know, here's uh, 1977. You know, again, if we were, if we were to print out that R set object, it would, the first number would be that. So if I want to get the first 90% of my data, I can just use the analysis function on that particular R set object to get that. And if I want to get the data that's held out from modeling, as you might expect, it's just the assessment. And that is 222, okay? So it's just like a, a really high level API for getting you know, what goes into the model and what isn't in the model. Um, from the same object. So again, we have 10 of those, 10-fold cross-validation. Um, yes? Uh, that's a good question. I never thought, I even thought of doing that. Huh. Okay, they're going to make me do that. Uh, 
Oh, so map over, so you're mapping over the splits vector. So this would be like the first element of that map. Yeah. yeah. So I'm kind of curious as to what it gives you back. Hmm. That's unexpected. But thank you for illustrating that about my package. Um, yeah, I mean, it does, we have some other things like there's like as.integer. So if you just want to get like, um, you know, which rows correspond. So there are, so you don't have to use analysis, so there's other things you can do. Um, yeah, but I never expected that to happen, so I'm going to fix that in the next version. No, no, no. Uh, okay. So, okay, so uh, I'm going to have a more complicated recipe here, and this is the one I use, like, teaching. This is not the, the best recipe I can come up with for these data, but um, I just took, without using all the, the variables, um, you know, I just took a couple of the qualitative factors like building type, neighborhood, um, and then some of the numeric ones like lot area we haven't seen, longitude and latitude, year sold. Um, you know, central area and year sold, it was really clear as an interaction. Um, and then, you know, this we've already seen, we log it. Now, the general living area and the lot area are very right skewed. This might make, you know, this might improve your like R squared by like 2% or 1%. It's not going to like resurrect a dead model. But again, it's not a, it's not a bad idea for something like linear regression, or especially a neural network who, you know, the, the cross product matrix is going to be at some point doing this variable minus its mean. And so you're going to get some values that are just in square that, and you're going to get some values that are very large. Um, there's not much harm in doing it. I, I think it generally improves things. Here's step other and step dummy like we did before. Um, and then here's the interaction like I talked about before. And then uh, there's another little thing I added on here is we're going to do a, 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 a um, B-spline for longitude and latitude. And the reason for that is if you just do some just simple ggplotting, if I plot longitude versus sale price, it's kind of a weird pattern here, but it's clearly nonlinear. It's like decreasing and then it resets and then it's decreasing again. Um, and the, the line here is a B spline. So I just basically monkeyed around with the degrees of freedom until I thought, oh, it's not overfitting, but it's not doing too bad. Um, if you do the same thing for, um, for latitude, um, you know, it looks a little bit better. And you might think, like, what's going on there and here? Like, what's with this big jump? And if I were to go back to the little leaflet diagram we had somewhere, um, Oh, Di's here, so she can give us, she can give us. Really? Yep. Yep. Okay, so that I've done, and actually I found all, like, the public schools and did distance features to those. Yeah. It didn't help. Yeah. Um, but this is downtown or this is the university, this is Yeah. But, but those longitude and latitude patterns are basically driven by, you know, you can see this gap here. Or like if you're, if you're going this way or that way, there are places where, yeah. So, yeah. So it's kind of interesting. Do you think integration is what? Well, I'm kind of worried because I know they scraped this from the assessor's office, so I don't want to like get blamed for, um, yeah. Uh, oh, really? So there's a bit at the end. Um, so you know, this was you know, I'd seen this data set before, and I hadn't really looked at it too much, and then it was used in a Kaggle competition, and then people like. Like, your OCD goes wild in capital competitions. So at the end, there's a guy who, like, he should have, like, a PI license. Like, he's investigated certain outliers that he just could not explain. And then he was, like, calling around and doing all this stuff to figure out, like, um, like who sold these and to whom? Because they're, like, there's five houses, like, exactly like this. And these three were sold, like, like at the same time to, like, buddies of some, you know, he's, he's it's, I mean, it's good. Um, but, man, this data has been scrutinized. So, um, Anyway, so, you know, it, we can encode, you know, we talked about this before with date, but location is encoded in two different ways here um, in terms of the geocode and the neighborhood. And so, uh, you know, again, if you think about this from the standpoint of um, 
feature engineering, like we can throw this data in a linear model, but we know it's not going to be as successful as it could be if we don't add some nonlinear component to it. So like when we talk about feature engineering, right? So that's like what we would do is we would look at our data and say, well, what is the best way to represent things? And I, I think I showed you earlier when we looked at these things, there are some neighborhood values that clearly those data are not, they seem like they're more in other neighborhoods than, you know, than the, one, the other data in that neighborhood. So it doesn't bother me too much to have two different ways to encode uh, location in here. And there's probably other ways of doing it too, like distance from the university and things like that. Um, uh, but anyway, so adding, adding beast lines in here to me um, is probably not the worst of ideas. You know, how interpretable is it? You know, you're not going to look at a coefficient of a beast line and be like, oh, I get that. But, in, but it will, in fact, improve performance. In fact, just using longitude and latitude, I can get an R squared in this data set of about like 60 or 70 percent, which is better than I thought it would be. Um, so anyway, um, yeah. So anyway, this is, this is the, we'll have another version of this in a little bit that has just a small modification, but this is the one I'm going to go forward with for fitting some linear models. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty not remarkable, it just has interactions and dummy variables, it has that pooling to other, but besides the beast lines, there's nothing really here that's all that exotic. So it's not like some autoencoder, you know, TensorFlow thing. Um, it's pretty straightforward. So, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to want to, um, we're going to take this object and we're going to want to process our, we're going to create a different version, a trained, diff, different trained version of our recipe for each one of these 90%. So we're going to add another column to this data set that's going to have a different trained recipe for each row. Right? And so that's the idea of this box that you have to re-estimate things that are inside the box. And then what we'll do is we'll fit models to the, that recipe, so we'll have another column that has a set of LM models in it. Right? And then from there we can get our holdout predictions and estimate performance. And again, this is a lower level API than I want it to be, but this is the one that's there right now. And so what we're going to want to do is take the data that are here and substitute them into basically um, when I go to prep this recipe. So instead of prepping the recipe on the entire training set, I want to prep it on the analysis set, let's say from that first row of the, of the um, tibble. Okay? So we're going to reapply this, we're going to reestimate the same recipe 10 different times with 10 slightly different versions of the data. Um, now when you do that, the thing you would probably think about doing is you want to you um, map. It's going to return a list so we can just say map. We want to do that across the CV splits, and then we want to have some function uh, that is basically like prep of some recipe. Okay. Well, it turns out that prep takes the recipe as the first object, and the data is the second object. And if you want to run map, it, may, it would be even better if you actually reversed those arguments because you're mapping over the data sets. So if you want to pipe things and all that, it would be better if it was reversed. And so given that we added a function that's horribly named, just called prepper, uh, which takes the split object, it gets the analysis set from it, and then processes the recipe. So the order is different here to make it easier to use. So if we just use map on this, map is going to give us our split object back. And since that's the first argument here, it makes it easier to do. If we didn't have this, and we'd have to write a wrapper anyway, because the first argument of prep is the recipe. Right, it's just a little bit of like minutia about the program a bit of it. Um, so what the code is going to look like when we do this, it's going to be, we're going to take the, the same object, we're going to pipe it into a mutate statement um, to create a new column. I'm going to call it aims under bar rec. Um, and basically I'm going to map across the splits. So for every row here, I'm going to take the split object, run the, the basically the prep function, I'm going to pass in which recipe should it use and other options um, such as retain. So one thing you notice about prep, the prepper here, it has the three dots. So anything, any of these arguments here get passed into the three dots, or actually it's just the retain argument here, gets passed in three dots and passed into prep. Okay. So this is basically a computational shortcut that avoids having a loop that just runs prep 10 times. We're just doing it with per map. Any 
And I haven't created the recipe yet. So it didn't take very long, and we print that back out. What we get is another column here that is full of recipe objects. Now, just for kicks, um, let's say we take that first recipe object, and let's go back here and look at that recipe for a second. And see, the first step is log, second is Yao Johnson, third is, so Yao Johnson, in case you don't know, is like the box Cox for information. It's that box Cox requires all your data to be strictly positive. Yao Johnson does exactly the same thing, but it can have negative data in it. So that, that's what I tend to use. Um, but the third step here is that pooling step. Just so to use that as an example, if we look, if we run um, the tidy method like I showed you before, and say tidy, this will, typhi, that's my new package, typhi. Um, it tells you what was um, pulled. So these are the ones that sort of survived the pulling process. Is that different from, let's say, the second realization of that? North Indian College Creek, Old Town, Edwards, Somerset, Northridge Heights, Gilbert, Sawyer, they're the same. But they have the potential to be different because it's a different data set every time, right? So that cutoff, if it's close to, you know, cutoff is close to some of those frequencies in the training set, since you're doing a different 90%, you might get a different pooling every time which means you might have different variable names every time, which means when we fit in a linear model, we actually might have a different number of coefficients every time. And, and a lot of times when I talk to people about this, they're like, wait, that's not good. And actually, it, it is in a way, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to capture the variation that the recipe and all the pre-processing kind of inflicts on the model, right? And so if it were giving us the same thing over and over again, that's great, that would be nice and stable. If it, give, if it gives us wildly different answers for every different 90% of the data, well, that would negatively affect the model, and then that would sort of come out in the wash of resampling. So it's good that we're seeing the same things here. That means it's nice and stable. But if it wasn't so stable, let's say we reduce the threshold down so it would capture less and less, or there would be more things on either side of that threshold, and it would change around a little bit. So performance-wise, this is a good idea. This is a, a good thing that it could potentially be different within each resample, because that's what we want to do. We want to capture that variation, okay? So when you see that sometimes, don't be alarmed that I'm getting different things inside of each resample. Um, this can also happen more, um, more drastically in some of the um, filtering functions in, in recipes. So one, thing, one way you can deal with um, highly correlated predictors is we have a, a pretty good algorithm that basically says, well, let me put a threshold on the absolute correlation between predictors. Let's say I want to get rid of any predictors that are like correlated by like 0.75 or more, right? So that's a filter that gets run, and, and when you run that, you might get, you might eliminate different predictors each time you run that inside of resampling. And then, of course, since you're getting rid of columns, that has a, a more um, cascading effect for steps below it. Okay, so there are certain things that are more likely to give you different results within different parts of the recipe. They're just more unstable, okay? But that it sounds awful, but that's a good thing. When that happens, you want that to be inside the resampling method so that it knows about it, basically. Okay, so where we stand right now in this whole process is we've added another column here. So now that we have our recipe, what we can then do is we can fit our model on the processed version of that recipe. So remember how we have that juice function? So now when we, we work with LM, we can give it, instead of giving it the aims under bar train, we can give it the resampled version of that process, you know, the, the recipe version of that data set that has the B-spline columns and it has the dummy variables and fit that model for whatever uh, features or predictors that are generated by the recipe. So the function is really simple. We can just create a little wrapper around LM. It takes the recipe object as, um, as the only argument. Um, and then again, the three dots here, we can pass in whatever formula or any options to LM that we want to use. The only thing we're doing differently here is instead of being Ames train, we're going to take the, um, the process version of the training set um, as our input, and then it'll fit the model on that. Okay? And again, the, the map is very similar. Um, we just give it, we operate over the recipe column, um, 
and then um, we, we fit the LM model and then we just we tell it to use all the predictors in the model. Uh, one thing about this is sale price, if you remember, has already been logged. So one thing recipe doesn't do is it doesn't change the name of that predictor. It doesn't change it to like log 10 parentheses. So you have to be careful sometimes that things are logged and it, but it still has the same name. So that happens pretty fast. Then we look at it again, and now we have a bunch of 10 different linear models based on a slightly different version of the processed training set. So again, if we just look at the first one, Ah, uh, that's a split, sorry. We have the fits. You know, so we have all of our, we have our interaction effect that we estimated. Here's the, you know, the pooled indicators for um, neighborhood, and here's all the spline coefficients, okay, for longitude and latitude. Uh, we can also use um, broom and use glance as a nice little way of summarizing the model. So, you know, just doing this R squared, you know, we think the R squared you get from the model, the adjusted R squared is about 80%. Um, you know, these are in log units, so our, our root mean squared error is, you know, sub 0.1 log units, which is good. Um, and we can look at AIC and things like that. Um, there's a lot you can do with these resampled estimates. Um, Right now, here comes the, the, I don't want to say the tricky part, but the little more complicated part. So remember, we're doing this to get our predictions on the holdout, the assessment set, right? So we fit our model. So the rest, to, to, to make the recipe, we only needed the, the split column of that tibble. And to create the, um, the LLM fits, we only needed the recipe part of that tibble because it has the training set built into it. But now what we want to do is we want to take our analysis set, which means we need the split column, we want to bake the recipe, which means we need the recipe column, and apply that to the model function, which means we need the fit column. So before, we just needed to pass in one argument to, to per, to per map, to um, operate across, let's say, the split column or the recipe column. But now what we need to do is we need to write a function that takes both the split, the recipe, and the model object. So the first thing we do is we take the split object and get the actual data that's been held out. And then we process that using bake. So we apply all those same, for each matched resample, we apply all those same preprocessing methods to that uh, holdout data set to get the processed version of that. And then what we can do is we can use the predict method of the linear model to get predictions. It's a little more fancy here um, for some, you know, maybe it's just how I wrote things. What I want to do is I want to get back a data frame that has the predicted values the residuals and the actual um, log 10 output. So I want to get a data frame back with different columns. Um, um, and so the fancy way I did that it was I just kind of like rebake the object. And so I get all the data back with it, like all the processed version of the, the recipe, and then just add some columns. Um, the one little bit here is um, I can add um, um, some things to save what the original row number is. Okay, since I'm doing tenfold cross-validation, when I get all these um, predictions back on the assessment sets, no one data point from the original training set is represented more than once. But I might want to merge this back with the original data set. So what I want to do is, um, in that, embed what the original row number was so I can actually do a merge on the original data set later. Yes? Yes. Because the steppers are sort of lost in the pre-processing by the time it gets to LM, and the predict object it can't actually be sorted back at the moment of the scale. Right? Correct. So the so the LM a way to attribute that somehow in there to sort of indicate it gets back at the very end. Basically the fifth column, right? So the predictors in the code that that we models in and then predictors predicted values in the original one? Uh yes. So the simple way of doing that would be uh, what that dot row is about, because I can match that against the original columns. So if I want to do things like partial residual plots, I want to plot the residuals versus some predictor to see if there's a non-random pattern, like maybe there's a variable I left out, right? So that was the original intent here, is having this dot row um, column lets me merge that back in with the original unprocessed data, 
and then I can do ggplots and do all sorts of things to figure out where the fit is not doing well. Okay, does that answer your question? Or were you getting at something else? Oh, you were talking about the residuals. Um, no, I, I mean, I was just really naively, you know, sort of, we're keeping track nicely of what the transformations were like. Long yeah. But, you know, say you have to manage a pointy head for your unemployment or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> you it back in the natural view. Yeah. So that we sort of lost with the print processes, right? Because, I mean, it's, it's all about exclusive processes and recipes, but we, we, didn't, we didn't log this in the sense that we made it reversible. Uh, we did, so the original, the outcome is modeled on the log scale, right? So the residuals are on the log scale. So we could just exponentiate the residuals at the end using yes, dplyr. One of the columns was your John, right? So we wanted to reverse that. Uh, those would be for the individual predictors, though. So, so all that, all that, pre, all that pre-processing, Yao Johnson, all the step, the dummy variables, that's all embedded into the model fit. Like the residuals and the fitted values are all yeah, products of that. Expert. Yeah. Right. So you would just need to exponentiate that if you wanted to. Yeah. Yeah, but, but back transforming is something that everybody's asked me about. So that something like that needs to be in there. Yeah. But you couldn't do anything with the model object at that point because it's all in the original right. units. Or it's all in the transform units. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so the important pieces to, to get out of this is we're going to take our, get our assessment data, we're going to bake it based on the, the uh, pre-processing we've estimated from the original analysis set, and then we're just going to use lm.predict, basically, or predict.lm to get predictions um, and save them in a data frame. Now, since we're going to do that, we, need, we have three different things to operate across. So what we want to do is we want to take the CV splits, And we're going to, for every row, we want to pass in to that function the recipe and the fits and the split object. So we need, to, it's almost like we want to write a for loop. We're not going to write a for loop. But um, it's equivalent of writing a for loop where we're going to execute that on those three columns for every row. And it turns out that Perl has a function that can do that, and it's called pmap. All right, let me first submit this. What PMAP does is you give it a list in the order of the arguments that the function has, and then what it does is uh, it's like map, but it knows to operate over the first element of this at the same time as the first element of this is the same time as the first element of this. So it's, it basically emulates a for loop over those three things. And then you just give it the function. Um, so it turns out with PER, um, so PER has this thing called like um, uh, map two. So if you only have two arguments, you can just give it those two arguments as the first two and then give it the function when execute. But if you have three or more, basically you need to use this pmap function to row-wise work across those three columns, if that makes sense. So we do get a bunch of warnings, and the reason for that is, so splines, um, give warnings when you have data that is outside the original um, data that was there. So what we're doing is, let me go back to this uh, leaflet plot, is um, especially on this little corner we have a couple outlying data sets. So there are some, some resamples that use the, the analysis set does not include these outlying things to the right here, these outlying properties um, down here. I don't know if you can see them. Um, so what happens is it builds a spline on all the data to the left of this, and splines can do really, really weird things in the tails. And so if you go to make predictions outside of the original range of the data, it produces a warning about that. And so that's what those warnings are about. They're not like, it wouldn't stop me from using the analysis, but again, this, since this is in, bless you, inside of resampling, all that very, if that is a big problem, that gets reflected in the holdout predictions, so that would show up in the, our performance estimates. Okay, but if you're wondering what that was, um, it says, you know, the values are beyond the boundary knots. Um, so what do we get out of this? Like, where are we going with this, Max? Um, is basically we get a column here that has 
uh, a data frame that has the predictions for those holdouts. So we have 33 data points, or I'm sorry, um, the first holdout has 222. So let's look at that one. Um, so the holdout predictions from the first fold is all the original data and then you know, the, la the last column, uh, for example, is um, dot fitted. And those are the predictions for those assessment values, the ones we held out. Okay. So what we have here is we have a column that is a list column. And every element of that list is a tibble of holdout predictions with the original data, with the original um, data that was here. Actually, I'm sorry, this is the process data that we just tacked on the um, uh, residual and predictions on. So if we want to, let's say we want to do that. So one of my professors had this saying that like the only way to be comfortable with your data is never to look at it. And um, so, you know, one thing we can do is, I think it's actually on the next slide, is um, what we can do is uh, we can calculate the, uh, we can calculate the, um, in fact, I think that's the first thing I do is I calculate the root mean squared error across each one of these data sets, right? I can just, you know, the, I have the residual or the fitted and the predicted. I could just, you know, run root mean squared error. And, I, and actually, let's do that. So now that we have them, we have a, another package in the, the tidy modeling called yardstick, which is like a tidy representation of like performance measures. And so when I run that, um, there's a function in there called, um, uh, where's it at? Metrics. And what metrics gives you is automatically for regression situation, it gives you the root mean squared error, the R squared, and the mean, uh, median absolute error. Okay, so if I were to look at um, performance on the first, um, let's do this. If I'm gonna map across that prediction data frame, run the metrics function, which gives me um, the, you know, the root mean squared or estimates, I get a tibble back. So in the first fold, my holdout estimate of the root mean squared was 0 0.0764. On the second one, it was a little bit worse, about 0.09. So you can see the variation in our, our estimates of performance. And then our overall resampling, like our overall cross-validation estimate of performance would take basically the average of those 10 values. So for that recipe in that particular model, we think that the, the best estimate we have of that model's performance in terms of root mean squared error is about you know, 0.079, and it's R squared is about 80%. Okay, so we did all the, that work to basically get these estimates. So we'll fit another model in a minute to these same resamples and things like that, so we can make a comparison between models. Um, that'll be a little bit easier to do than what we just did here, because it's a higher level interface. But again, this is all resampling bits to show you how like, we operated on recipes um, across the resamples, match that to a corresponding LM fit, and then made predictions on the assessment set to estimate performance. That's what the last 10 slides have been about. Okay. Now, let's say we want to do some, like, you know, look and see, was this a good idea to do? Like, are there any, are there any um, uh, data points that weren't predicted well? So I don't know about you, but when I took regression analysis in graduate school, I think they did me a tremendous disservice by constantly sh teaching us to re-predict the data set that we used to build the model and look at residuals, right? So let's say we took our training set, our entire training set, and fit a linear regression model, and we do residual analysis on the residuals that come out of that model. Um, and for linear regression, that's not like the most, that's not the worst thing to do in the world. But if you fit a random forest model to that data and get the residuals, if they're not all zero, then you did something wrong, right? So a lot of these models, these machine learning models, the residuals that you just naively generate from the model, they're not, they're not good ways of assessing performance because it's almost like overfitting is built into them. Like imagine, we'll talk about k nearest neighbors in a minute, but imagine you took a property um, and looked at the property in the training set that was closest to itself and made a prediction on that. Well, the thing that's closest to itself is itself, right? So your predictions would always, your residuals would always be zero. In random forest and neural networks, they tend to almost operate that, like that. As the complexity goes up, they tend to just be memorizing the training set. So what I'm getting at here is, if we're going to do any residual analysis on models, what a, good, a, a better idea would be, since we have those holdout predictions just laying around in a bunch of tibbles in a column, let's just bind all those together and look at those residuals. Because all of those residuals that we just took the time to estimate are data points that were not used in the model, remember. 
So that overfitting is not built into this. So if you were to do this with a, a more high performance model, like a support vector machine or something like that, you don't want to just get the residuals from that model. You want to use the holdout residuals to look and see where things didn't work and where they did work. Okay? So again, those things are all sitting in a column, a list column, that are all tibbles. And what we can do is, it's really simple. We just say bind rows on that column, and we're basically concatenating all those together, and now we have a ready-made uh, tibble that we can put in the ggplot. Uh, one thing I will do is I'll put things um, back into the original scale. So I'm going to exponentiate the, the predicted and the observed sale prices so that they're in actual dollars and not in log dollars. So if I were to just look at that, um, it still has all the original data, um, but I do have the fitted and the, um, the sale price columns in here. So then what I can do is just make a ggplot where I can plot the sale price versus the fitted values. Um, I'll plot the points and then I'll plot the diagonal line, which is where we want all the data points to be. We want to be on a, on a perfect diagonal. And then just do a little smooth to see like, okay, are there any patterns here um, that fall off the, uh, the diagonal? And what that looks like is this. So you can see, you know, in a lot of ways it's not that bad. Um, it does kind of peel off here as, as house, the real house price tends to get more expensive, we tend to be under predicting it. So there's a little bit of like, it's partially regression to the mean, it's partially, we don't have a predictor that is, um, accentuates, uh, in, in the predictor set that I use so far, we don't have one that differentiates the expensive houses from the less expensive houses. So there's probably other predictors in this data set we could use in a linear model to fix that a little bit. And the way what we would do, and we have the data right here to do it, is we would look at partial residual plots. We probably plot the residual on the y-axis for some predictor that was not in the model. And if we see a nice trend, that says, oh yeah, we should have put that in the model. And then try this all over again with that predictor and look at these residual plots. The other thing we would typically do is we would look and say, like, where did it really go wrong? Well, what are these three about? So these are three houses whose recorded sale price is not all that high. But for some reason, we're pr predicting to be like the first and fourth and fifth most expensive houses. So like that's not good, right? So, so if anything, our, we might want to look at the, the median absolute errors. That might be a better assessment of performance here because we have outliers that are very, very large in this data set. So you know, that's, again, if I were looking at this, um, I would look at those d data points and figure out like what went wrong there. So. Um, in the, in the book we're publishing, one of the main data sets we have is uh, Chicago public transportation data. And there's one data point in there that no matter what we did, we could not predict well. And I was like, what the heck? And so we have its date and all that. So I just Google the date. It's like some day in like uh, June or July a couple of years ago. And, uh, and it turns out that there was an arts festival downtown. The Black Hush who just won the Stanley Cups. It was a parade that same day. And Lincoln Park, who's from Chicago, were playing a concert downtown that day. Right, so like ridership on public transportation was the highest that it had ever been at any point. Now, what do I do about that, right? Do I put an indicator for when the Blackhawks, because that's never gonna happen again. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, there's some things like, there's questions like, like what do you do about that? I don't wanna just like get rid of a data point that I don't like, but at the same time, it's gonna drag on my performance down. But, but that's the point of what I wanna get to here is, and this is what ended up happening by somebody who's not me, is they look at those data points like, what the heck? Like, I've tried like 17 different models. I can't predict these three damn houses well. And so that's what you, that's the whole idea is you would find out, okay, what, what differentiates these? Maybe there's some feature on that house that like, you know, they're next to like, you know, a, a graveyard. I don't know what it could be. Um, um, and try to figure that out and then put predictors in the model to accommodate that. That's where you would go from here, okay? Uh, but again, not to beat a dead horse, but the important part is that um, it wouldn't be that bad for linear regression. But for most other models, again, just using the resid function and plotting that would maybe not be the best of ideas. Just re, you know, re-predicting your training set, the same data used to build a model. Don't try not to do that. So, um, so big picture here is what we just did is we took a, a, a match set of our pre-processing method and our modeling method, which was a linear model, and we resampled that to just estimate its performance. Okay, and then again, we might look at other 
like maybe we add a term and do this again to figure out did performance go up or down. And we can keep doing that basically and, and get converge to a point that we think we have the best model. And then maybe if, if we feel satisfied at that point, then that's what we go to the test set with. So, so at the point where you think you have the best model that you've discovered maybe through resampling, the process at that point is I make one final recipe that's on my entire training set and I make my one linear model that's on that you know, entire training set, and that's like my go forward model, okay? All these other models we just fit and estimated are only in service of estimating performance of that final model, okay? So that's like the big picture of like, why are we doing this? That make sense? Okay. So, um, to, so to streamline that a little bit, <clears throat> it's not a very tidy method, but the carrot package, um, one of the first things I did is I wrote a recipes interface so that you can give it a recipe and have it do all the legwork that we just did kind of automatically for you. Um, and so the way um, the syntax you would use um, would be uh, the main function in, in carrot is something called train. And, and generally you would give it like X and Y and then you would tell it what kind of model that you want to use. So if you want to use random forest or a glimnet or whatever. There's like 200 some models that it wraps around. Um, then you can just very simply have it figure out all the syntax for the underlying model and then you can keep using the same interface. So it's like a really, really high level wrapper around like, you know, 200 or so models in R. Okay. Uh, the main difference now though is instead of giving it X and Y, we can give it the recipe in the original training set and then have it do all the machinations we just did automatically inside itself. Um, another thing that it, it also facilitates, uh, which you can still do in the, using PER, um, it also has a bunch of resampling in it, or I'm sorry, parallel processing in it. So we just fit 10 different models for one, um, for one combination of pre-processing and, and model type. There was no reason why we did those sequentially. I mean, it was just easier to use MAP to do that. But if, if those, each one of those took like, you know, an hour to run, um, each one of those model fits is independent of the other. So it would not be hard using this other package called FUR, which is uh, a parallel version of PER, to run those on you know, different cores on your machine. And, and generally speaking, you get a very, very nice speed up by doing that. So all that's kind of built into Carrot right now, and we're kind of replicating all that, um, all that functionality in more tidy packages, but they're not all quite there yet. So what we're going to use is we're going to use a nearest neighbor model. So it's a nonlinear model. And here's how the nearest neighbor works. Is let's say you only had longitude and latitude in your model, and you're trying to predict this data, this house here that sells for about $244,000. So if you did like an eight nearest neighbor model, what you would do is you would figure out the, the eight closest data points in the predictor space and then you would average their outcome from the training set. So these are all training set points in red. So this might be a test set point or a point that you just want to predict in the future. So what you would do is you would use your predictors, in this case just longitude and latitude, to figure out what the, the eight most, let's say, similar data points are in the original training set, and then average their outcomes, and that's what you use for prediction. Okay? But the problem here is, well, you know, we call this a K nearest error model. What should K be? Right? There's no, so these is like a hyperparameter in the model, meaning that unlike uh, linear regression that's just slopes and intercepts, there's no analytical formula that says, you know, give me your predictors and your outcome and I'll put them into this formula and out pops out a value of K. So you can't like directly estimate um, K from the data. So what you have to do basically is you have to give it a grid of the data points that you want to try. You might say, let's try the one nearest neighbor model, which in this particular instance is the one that's most likely to fit. When you only look at like the person closest to you and say, what do you think? You're not, you're not really getting a consensus prediction. So with K nearest neighbor models, you worry about K being really small as being something that's overfit. And then you might try two, three, four. At some point, you think you're going to get the best, you know, the best value of K prediction wise. But as you increase K too much, you start to oversmooth the data too much and you start to underfit because you're averaging houses together that aren't alike each other. Right? So what we've got to do now, which we didn't have to do with a, a linear model, is we've got to tune this model. We have to figure out different values of K. So the solution to that that people typically do is they do the same thing that we just did, but they do it for different values of K. 
So let's say we try a uh, number of neighbors between 1 and 20. So we would resample the one nearest neighbor model and get its performance, its root mean squared error, try the two nearest neighbor model and get its performance, and then we get this graph of like the number of neighbors versus root mean squared error, and we find basically the value of k that has the best performance. And then let's say that's k equal to like 12, just for kids. So once we've, we've done that tuning of the model, then our final model there uses the entire training set to, with a value of k equal 12, and that's again what we would go forward with. Okay, so that's the process of model tuning is we have, there's another parameter, I'll show you what it is in a second, but we have this, this, this hyperparameter, this metaparameter in the model that we can't directly plug in our data and get an estimate for. And we'll use resampling to solve that problem of selecting what it is. Now the package we're going to use has a, another tuning parameter associated with it, and uh, what it does is it weights the neighbors differently. So um, you can imagine instances, and there's probably data points around here, that you know, let's maybe look at um, predicting this data point. It has neighbors that are closest, but um, it might be that, that, you can't even see it on the same plot, this might be a nearest neighbor of this point, like as long as k is big enough. So what, what the, the package that we'll use in a minute does is it weights the contribution of the prediction inversely by the distance. So it, it, when it gets its predicted value from the training set, it weights the data points that are closest to it more because they're more similar. And if you have a, an outlier in that k nearest neighbor set that's really far away, its inverse distance would be close to zero and it would weight it very little. But there's different weighting schemes you can use. You can use inverse, you can use like, um, like a Gaussian, um, um, like an exponentially weighted Gaussian. So there's a bunch of different um, parameters, like more qualitative tuning parameters, like what type of weighting function do I use? And so what we'll have is we'll have two parameters. We'll look at k is something we tune over, and then I think it's like three different types of weighting schemes to weight the nearest neighbors and see if that has an effect. They just call it, uh, I'm, uh, if you were using a Gaussian, you'd probably call it a, well, I mean, it doesn't have to be Gaussian. Um, I don't, I've never heard it referred to as a kernel estimate. They just usually call it weighted distances. Um, yeah, there's probably a dissertation out there that they, reducing, uh, reproducing Hilbert space nearest neighbors or something fancy, so, yeah. So, uh, wow, that's a, that's a recipe. Uh, this is almost identical to what we're doing previously. There's only two different parts here that I inserted right here and here. The thing is, if we're going to calculate distances, then we want to make sure everything's on the same scale. So what we're going to do, th these plots I showed you are just showing longitude and latitude as the distant metric. But what we're going to use is we're going to use the entire predictor space. So we're going to use all these variables to calculate distance to the data points. We're going to use the longitude and latitude and their basis, their, their spline format. We're going to use our dummy variables. All those things are going to get put into the, the distance calculation. And the dummy variables, for example, are going to need to be on the same um, units as the transformed general linear area because it's a distance function. You don't want the scale of the predictor to dominate the distance calculation. And so the way we get around that is we center and scale our data and that makes sure that all of our columns um, at that point, the recipe have mean zero and standard deviation one. So that means that distance calculation is, will work better because it's not influenced by the scale of each individual predictor. Now, I, I put it in here. We're looking at this because this is not so trivial. Up to this point, um, until we do the dummy variables, we did have some factor variables in. So this is the earliest that we can do things. Um, so what we found is, especially for interactions, is that it's probably better to center and scale your data and then compute interactions and spline functions rather than computing that stuff and then centering and scaling them at the end. Now you can certainly try that here. You can just do another recipe and see if that works better. So I can't say that that works universally, but we do have, we do have an example or two where you might actually take a significant interaction and make it go away by centering and scaling it at the wrong time. So it, it, it can be kind of sensitive to that. But it's the same recipe we did before. All I'm doing is I'm just changing, at this point, the scale of all the predictors to be exactly the same. Okay. Any questions about that? Yes. Uh, 
uh, tilde at the start, and then you'd plus, just like you would in a uh, regular model formula. So um, the character code is actually not that complicated. Uh, well, the, the first thing we do is I want to use the same resamples that I used before. Um, so uh, our sample and caret don't always provide the same folds. So there's a little conversion function that if we start off with some R sample folds, we can convert them sort of into carrots format um, and then use those. So uh, caret has a control function that uh, dictates the type of resampling you want to do. If you want to give it something to that control function that says exactly what the exactly what data points uh, should be in the assessment and the analysis set, you can do that. And that's kind of what I'm doing here, is I'm telling it to do um, regular old cross-validation, but use the same uh, indices that I used from our sample before, which is generally if you're going to resample two different models, do it on the same resamples um, so that they're matched. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to define exactly what k-nearest neighbor models I want to use. So um, the number of neighbors I'm going to try is 1 through 9. Um, we're not using the type of, th this parameter here is required, but it doesn't impact our calculations. We're not using a specific type of distance calculation that this would affect. Um, and then the types of, um, of weighting schemes we're going to look at is rectangular, meaning that basically you're not weighting differently by distance. So rectangular means that there's no change in um, the, the prediction calculation, it just ignores the distance uh, when it does that. Triangular means it's basically like a linear distance, so it linearly downweights uh, neighbors that are further away, linear by their distance. And then Gaussian is what you kind of expect is it gives really, really high weights to uh, neighbors that are close by and then it exponentially decays as the distance gets larger. Okay. So two tuning parameters, one is number of neighbors, the other is the distance function, and then um, the caret code is really simple. You just give it the recipe, the training set, you tell what method to use, and then give it the details that we worked out here in terms of the tuning grid and the resampling method. And this is even a little more complicated than it needs to be because of the R sample bit. Um, and even if you wanted to run this, it's going to run really fast, but if you wanted to run it in parallel, it, 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 it's, it's a very simple change to do that. So we have our recipe. Let's convert the resamples and make the grid. Um, and just one other, th well, I'm going to load carrot first. Um, one other thing is I use expand.grid here. So I'm actually looking at 27 different submodels. So I'm, 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 I'm doing tenfold cross-validation across 27 different model specifications. So when I run that, it's usually where I do some interpretive dance to distract you from it taking for a while. Um, so again, it's iterating. So we have 27 models. So it's 270 Kinnear Stammer models is what it's doing. Um, it's taking longer than I thought it would. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> So model R is not deprecated, but it's close. I mean, on, on, I think on the website, Hadley says, it fulfilled his goal as being a teaching tool, um, which means that I don't think he's going to develop it anymore. I mean, you basically, like somebody asked him this at the conference, he goes, that's Max's problem. Um, so you can kind of take that off the table for now. Um, all the other packages, like R sample and recipes and yardstick and all that stuff, I mean, that's basically its own little, I mean, it, the recipes works with carrot, but for the most part, those things are independent implementations of things that um, overlap quite a bit with Carrot, but on the other hand, um, they can do a lot of things that Carrot doesn't. So if you want to use survival analysis or time series models or um, do some things with like hierarchical Bayesian models, like all that will work in the tidy modeling framework. Um, Carrot is all about like regression or classification. So, um, so Carrot, it's not feature complete, but it's basically a situation where I've done probably as much as I can do to without rewriting it again. So new models will be added, and I'll make sure things work and all that. 
but at the same time, that's, that's pretty much in a good place right now. Um, and all the new stuff, like there's some things we want to do, like there's some, so you know, we're doing a grid search is what we're doing to optimize this model. There are these things, I don't think they work especially well for the examples I've tried, but there's these things like Bayesian optimization methods that use Gaussian processes to predict where the next tuning parameter should be, right? And there are nonlinear optimization methods you can use. Adding those things into the, the tidy modeling verse is really easy compared to carrot. So I think all the future development is going to go into that. But there are many things that it's kind of lacking right now. It wasn't until like about eight months ago we didn't really have any parallel processing for PER. So we have at least one implementation of that. All the tuning stuff I'm doing carrot, you know, that's what we're kind of working on now. So that, it's just going to take a while for that to catch up and even surpass what carrot can do. Yeah. Thank you for the distraction. Um, so if we print this model object out, what it does basically is, is uh, it gives me that same grid with a bunch of numbers. So this is basically the average of the 10 holdout root mean square estimates for a one nearest neighbor model with a rectangular weighting scheme. And if I look at the one nearest neighbor model with a triangular weighting scheme, it's, well, it's identical in this case. Uh, it is, well, okay, it's a one nearest neighbor, so the weighting scheme doesn't matter. Um, that's why they're the same. Uh, but then when we go to two neighbors, you know, we can look at how that changed. The root mean squared error went a little bit down. Um, so we can pull through this and try to make some sense out of it, or we could even better say ggplot, and it plots the profiles. So each one of these data points, again, is the average of 10 holdouts. You can see that we are probably overfitting to some degree with a one nearest neighbor model, and as we increase that to two, the root mean squared error goes down, so that's good. Um, it looks like it bottoms out around like, maybe eight or nine neighbors, and it looks like the, um, the triangular weighting scheme tend to work best, okay? Because that's where we're getting the lowest root mean squared error, okay? So again, all that stuff we did with PMAP and, and PER and all that stuff, that's all automated inside of Carrot, um, and it gives you kind of like the, the end result. Now, let me print that object out again. One thing Carrot does oops, is at the end here it says that if you just pick the winner, what had the, the lowest root mean square error, eight neighbors in a triangular uh, weighting scheme, which is this data point right here, it, it thinks to be the best. And you can change that if you want. There's like a little update function. You don't have to go through all this again. You can just say, I want seven neighbors in this weighting scheme. But what it then does is we fit 270 different models to get to this point. And then the 271st model it fits, takes that recipe, it executes it on the entire Ames data set, and then it puts it into the k-nearest neighbor model again using the entire training set. So if I do any predictions off of this k-n fit object, that's the k-n model using the entire training set. So all those 270 models that I'd use for resampling are gone and they're never used again. Okay. So you can see this interface is nice and smooth. I mean, it's making a lot of choices for you and it's like really, um, it's pretty easy to use and we'll get the same API basically for the, you know, so you're not writing a bunch of per commands for different things. Um, yeah. So is this root mean squared error for the entire set or is the, it was the cross-validation? It's the uh, cross-validation. Yeah, I don't compute any, I, and some people could ask me to do this, I never re, I just never re-predict the training set, I just don't, yeah. So Yeah. You know, so you want that next to run the side of bootstrap Well actually right now I've got a whole branch that's doing that. Oh. So I'm hoping like in the next like three weeks that'll be done. So you can, you can run it right now. I mean, you could download that branch right now and use recipes with RFE and, and those feature selection methods. Um, the prediction methods aren't set up yet. Um, so yeah, you can do that. Um, so you can use this in feature selection if you, if you don't mind using that branch for now. Um, now, in general though, I mean, n you know, there's a lot of discussion about this in the stack community. Nested cross-validation is something that people say, oh, you know. So here's the thing is, we expect there to be some bias here, that we're basically coming up with this grid and this plot, and we're picking the winner and saying that's what performance is, 
right? But there's some optimization bias going on here. Um, so I don't, I've never experienced that to be large. I've read the papers about that, and I think if you're using very, very um, short and wide data sets, it's more likely to happen, like pathologically short, like maybe 50 data points and thousands of predictors. I think optimization bias there could happen a lot worse, but I've, I've never experienced an optimization bias that's above the experimental noise. I honestly haven't. So I, I'm not saying it's not a real thing, but I think it's really context specific. Um, but the way to get around that, if you really wanted to, would be to do a nested resampling method. And so there's a whole vignette about that. Is it here? Uh, it's in the R sample. Um, let me look. Where's that? Yeah, so there's a, a vignette about that um, nested resampling. Uh, so I used like a support vector machine and in the end found that the performance estimates weren't any different using nested and non-nested. And that wasn't a trick. That I just used some simulated data and things like that. I, it, but this is consistent with what I find is, is that, yeah, theoretically it's better, but the, the computational time is quadratic. So doing this thing, the amount of time it would take to do it in tenfold cross validation, it, you square that, and at least that's how long it'll take in nested. So there's a reason we do that with feature selection, but in general, if you don't have feature selection, I don't really think it's worth doing the nested. Uh, for the speed processing, then the speed processing, or then the like, parameter tuning. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't find it. But it, I mean, if you do have an example, I'd love to see it. I, I don't mean that in any like argumentative sense. It's just it'd be nice to show an example. Um, Yes. So did you guys hear that? Um, so let's say you have like a ton of data, like millions of records. You know, it, K might be dynamic. It might be there are areas of the predictor space where K should be small and other predictors. So I mean, so the, I have two thoughts about that. Is number one, don't use K nearest neighbors <laughs> for that because I mean, basically you have to store the training set, right? So that's the problem with uh, support vector machines to some extent, but definitely K nearest neighbors is to make any predictions on future data, you need the entirety of the training set. Now there's things like uh, LVQ learned, uh, what is it, vector, oh, I can't remember what it's LVQ stands for, uh, learned vector quantitization. There are things that can kind of approximate Kahner's neighbors but don't use all the neighbors. Um, so if you have a really fast way of computing distance, then that's fine, like if you have it in a database. So, so I used to work in um, computational chemistry and what we would do is we could take a, a drug and look at its chemical formula, and there's actually extremely fast ways of computing similarity between two different molecules based on their formula. So we could do something like that um, very quickly in databases in computational chemistry. But generally speaking, that's, that's tough to do otherwise. But, but your point about K being dynamic is a good one. So, um, the other thing that I learned in computational chemistry is, have you ever heard that expression, uh, there's an old expression from the 80s that um, all politics are local, um, which means that, you know, we could talk about the politics, but, you know, people in Massachusetts care about different things than people in Texas and so on in the, in the U.S. if you're from Australia, from, maybe that's lost on you, but, um, 
But th the point is um, that what we found a lot when we have a lot of data is that local models always be global models. So it, you, it, we found that like it's better to figure out like, okay, we want to predict this data set if you have a million rows to then figure out where in the predictor space you are and then develop on the fly a model that is really only uses the relevant data for, and then make a prediction off of that. So we found that that was more of a winning strategy than, because, you know, as a statistician, we think, like, how well does my data approximate the true underlying form? And if you think about it from that perspective, you're like, well, more data is better, right? We're just, like, you know, filling all the holes in the, in the predictor space and, and, you know, our sample size goes up. But, again, if you have a very dynamic system, that global model is going to have a lot of information in it that you don't care about because, you know, and so that's what we found is in those situations, um, it was better to have something that was way more local uh, on less data than a big model on everything. So, yeah, your, your point is really well point. Yeah. So in the, in the Daleks um, uh, session earlier, uh, people kept saying the same thing that I say, which is the mantra of every statistician, it depends, right? So every, every question anybody ever asked me, it's some form of it depends, right? And so, so I, I tend to like root mean squared error um, above all, but um, it depends on where you're working and what you're trying to do. So for example, like if we just want to do like in this application, if we only care about identifying the most expensive houses, then maybe root mean squared is too, um, too uh, strict. Because that's like a ranking problem. So if that were what I would do, I would look at Spearman's correlation. Because it doesn't matter if we predict the, the most expensive house, if we mispredict it by twofold. As long as we predict it the highest, that's what we care about. And so a, a major choice about when we start on any of these projects is how we're going to measure success. And I, I tend not to like the robust methods at all because I want my performance measure to be really sensitive to outliers, right? Because that could sink the ship. So I, I, I want to, I don't, I'm not a fan of the, the robust, like you know, median absolute errors and things like that. Um, and I don't like R squared because it's a measure of correlation and not of accuracy. So, uh, so I, you know, by default almost, I mean, I know there's like a thousand other variations. The um, concordance correlation statistic's good, but sometimes it's hard to explain to people. That's like a correlation statistic that also um, encapsulates error into it. So you could have like a, you could have a great R squared in a model. It's like a really tight plot of the reverse predicted, but it's really off the diagonal line. So that would have a really poor root mean squared error. And sometimes you get that with boosted trees a lot. Um, it's like a lot of regression to the mean. You have like a really good R squared, but the root mean squared error is awful because there's error. So I, I just tend to use that for regression problems more than anything else. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. They're probably not going to be called pipelines because everybody uses pipelines. It's probably not going to be called a pipeline. I, don't, I, I should have like a, you know, something on Twitter like vote for like protocol, workflow, pipeline. Um, but yeah, um, so, so where things are right now is the, the piece that I've, I've, I think I've got nailed down is the one thing about carrot that you can maybe see is if you wanted to try a different model, the carrot API doesn't really change all that much. If you want to use a neural net, you'd say method equal neural net, and everything else is the same. So rewriting that sort of unified model interface is what I've been working on for like the last year, and I think I finally got that down. So now that that's done, it sort of opens the floodgates for a bunch of other things. So there's a, a package a guy just started writing that I, I hopefully I'll work with him called Tidy Tune, which would <laughs> handle all the tuning. So one thing Care doesn't do is it, it doesn't allow you to tune over the pre-processing parameters. So if I wanted to optimize what that threshold should be for step other, like Care can't really do that. But Tidy Tune or whatever package we end up making is going to be able to do that. 
But to do that, you need an object that encapsulates the pre-processing in the model and maybe any um, feature selection and any post-processing. And so that's probably one of the next steps is to come up with whatever that is and give that methods um, to do that. So yeah, that's the plan. Um, because well, again, like when we, when we resample, I know I'm all about resampling, but like when we resample, that's what you want. And what you'd like to have is that box. That's everything that's in that box. And so, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, you come in, you get a recipe, you then do feature selection or whatever, and then you put it in the model, and then you calibrate the predictions. What comes out of there is what, you know, we should have an API that you start here and end here and not have to do anything much in the middle. That's the plan. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry, is that the last piece? Yeah. So what this did was it used resampling to tune the model to figure out what K in the weighting parameter should be. And then what it does automatically is it embeds that final model fit with the trained recipe and the K&N model inside of this object. So if I were to do like predict this Ames test, uh, then all these predictions are from a model that are based off of the entire training set. But at what point, like, I guess it's hard to articulate when, but when do you use the test part? Like, is it, like, yeah. you, That's you always have, like, you know, your paper or your paper done, and then you just sort of, like, like, you know, like, I don't know, do, like, a switch of ringing? So it's like a, what is the, what is the phrase? It's a heuristic process. Yeah. You don't know that you're done until you're done. Or, you know, so, like, yeah. So you try different things, and if you find something that either due to what you need the model to do or time constraints, you feel like, you know what, I like this, or I'm, I'm willing, you know. The, the phrase we had in research is you never finish anything, you just stop working on it, right? So at some point you have like some stopping mechanism where your boss is like, come on, right? And, and then you maybe have like two or three models that you're like, I kind of like these, but it's hard for me to choose. And you know, maybe their resampling statistics are about the same. So at that point, you know, I'd pick like one or two of those and then take them to the test set and say, okay, where do they do on the test set? And assuming that that differentiates them, you could pick one of those to go forward on. But I mean, you know, you can, my OCD goes wild sometimes where I'm like, there's that one damn data point that I just can't get and I'll try everything I can. Um, now, what I've typically done in, in, in situations where I was doing this as a job is I had not like scripts, but like protocols that I would follow. Like I start with these five models and these basic pre-processing methods and I put that on my grid and they all go off in parallel and they come back and give my results and I say, okay, I like this one and like this one, but I really like this one, but man, it doesn't do well in the very high end of the performance. So then I do some feature selection and try to make that what I like. So it's like a, it's like a sieve, right? You start off with a bunch of different models and pre-processing methods. Some just fall out because you just don't like them or they don't work all that well. And then you do a little bit of work on the one or two that you do like until you're like, you know, I've beaten the, this thing to death. And so let's pick this one and go to the test set. That's generally how it works, yeah. yeah. Yes? No, so that's one thing I like about it. I hate having to see bind things in a formula. I mean, that bothers me. And um, like the formula method, if you have multivariate outcomes, you just can't say y1 plus y2 plus y3 tilde and then your predictors. So you have to see bind y1 comma y2 y3. And that, that, like, that bothers me. So one cool thing about recipes is you can specify your model like that. So you can have things, you can have multiple things on the left-hand side of the model and then do PCA on them, or do, like somebody asked me about transforming them uh, in the break and things like that. So it's, it's actually designed for other, I've kept it pretty open. So, and there's a lot more about this like in blog posts and things like that, but 
there are a lot of model types that don't have simple predictors and outcomes. So like, um, like has anybody ever heard, heard the Bradley Terry model? So it's a model for like um, um, doing competitions between things like sports, right? And, and that model is really, really different structurally than most every other model, or like linear mix models, right? So you have, you have um, columns in your design matrix that are predictors, like your strata, or like you know, your subject effect. And so recipes is really designed to do a lot more than what I'm showing you here, because it's kind of an open palette. There's very few rules about like, um, I mean, we're working off rectangular data sets, but they can be many, they can be like multi-block type of things. So it's, it's a lot more open. And if you find situations where it doesn't do, like if you find like, um, well, I'd like it to do this, but it doesn't, I'd, I'd love to hear because I've deliberately tried to make it um, less restrictive as it uh, is, you know, minimally restrictive. Yeah. Yes. You mean like in resampling or? Yeah, so there's different resampling functions you could do. You could write your own too, but, um, but there's, and, and somebody, somebody put it, uh, they're gonna probably put in a PR soon to add even more. Um, I don't know, I'm a, so like you might like, um, you might have like longitudinal data, like you have subjects, and you might wanna do the splitting at the subject level. Because the rows aren't, as, you know, if they're stacked on top of each other, the rows aren't independent from each other. The, the blocks of people are independent. So, you know, like there's a leave group out, uh, I forget what it's called, but uh, like if you want to split at that level and things like that, you can do that. Yeah. Uh, no, you just give it, um, so assuming that your data have been uh, gathered like in TidyR format, like, you know, like let's say it's like a longitudinal study, so you have a column for subject and a column for time. So you would do your, um, when you do the, um, oh, what I, it's going to drive me nuts what the function name is, um, group fold CV. So what you would do is you would give it um, the group. And that can be, I think that's one, I misspelled single. Uh, that, um, thank you, spell check. Um, you know, if, if it's multiple levels, you can concatenate them together and do some sampling like that. Um, so yeah, and, and if there, again, I've been trying to consolidate resampling methods in here. Because one thing that's bad about R is everything, I'm not saying you have to do it my way, but like the one thing that's bad about R is everybody implements their own tenfold cross-validation. Let's just not do that anymore. So like I was talking to uh, uh, Rob about this and they have a bunch of time series stuff. I'm like, well, let's have an interface here for it. Yeah. All right, so let me get back to the notes real quick because I have one minute. I'm gonna make this count. Um, so, you know, I did the same thing where we collapsed using caret. Caret automatically stacks all the out of sample predictions together in a sub-object called pred. And I did the same thing as I did before is these are the holdout um, predictions. And what's interesting is you don't see those, those three houses here that were really poorly predicted. Um, those are being predicted very high here. Um, and so you might say like, what's that about? Like is KNN inherently better than, you know, their, their root mean squares are about the same. But you know, this plot I like a lot better because I don't have these, it's not peeling off as much on the high end and I'm not having really big outliers here. And it turns out that um, this guy who contributed to Ames Housing, um, he like did all this extra work in geocoding and basically he did a bunch of like, you know, PI work and figured out that, you know, there's these houses that um, he thinks that this guy basically sold them his friends at like a discount. I don't think he's saying it's money laundering, but like at the same time he's like, no, they're real sales, but there are, co there are houses in that neighborhood that are almost identical that it sell for twice the amount. And so then you might say to yourself, well, geez, well, then why did k and work there? But there's like three or four of them. Actually, he thinks that there's five of them. So as long as at least one of those houses was in the training set, it was the nearest neighbor of the others. So linear model doesn't have the ability because it's like a global model fit. And since k and is very local, as long as the training set had one of those five houses in it, then the nearest neighbor bit would work really well and it would bias the estimate down or actually up more than it should be. So, so for a weird reason, the data is kind of contaminated, I feel, but KNN worked with that. 
So I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's the situation here is that those three um, houses that we mispredicted earlier are extremely undersold. So they're almost like aberrant data points. Anyway, um, yeah, so, uh, so that was all off of this Cagwell competition. And that's basically it. Um, I'm one minute over, I apologize. Um, but any final questions or anything? Um, yes. Yeah. Is that just that pred um, variable in the slide above? Here? Is that the train? So this is the object that came out of train. And I set a variable up here that says save predictions equal final. So that says save the out of sample predictions only for the best nearest neighbor model. And that comes out in a data frame, nice and formatted for you in a data frame, a data frame here that's a sub object. That's on, that's on all the train data. So that has, is, that's a data frame that's the same size as the original Ames train data set, but all the predictions are the holdout predictions that were done, the, all the assessment set predictions, just like we did before. Yeah. And what you could do is you could match these up to the ones we got for the linear model and plot those against each other and figure out the places where the linear model didn't do well and Canaan did or vice versa if you wanted to. I think what you're asking is it's not on the test set. Yeah, it is not on the test. I didn't, actually didn't do anything on the test set here. Uh, I forgot that slide, yeah. So. Yes. Correct. It's not just repredicting the training set. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, is there a way to standardize this as we did with statistics? Like this bit? Like in memory? Uh, not yet. So you'd have to use fur with the map oh. with the map functions. Yeah. Um, and you just one thing about that is one thing I did here is I saved the recipe and the model object and just and returned different things. That's overall a bad idea because some of those model objects can be very, very large. And so if you're going to do tenfold, you're going to like take like maybe a three gigabyte model footprint and you know, multiply that by 10. So in generally when I do this stuff, I have a function that does the recipe, the model fit, and the predictions, and it saves the predictions. Um, and that's why I do Carrot. Carrot never returns the individual models in resampling for that exact reason. So I wouldn't exactly do it this way. I would just return the, the data frame with predictions. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I mentioned before we artificially, in the splitting process, and not otherwise, we categorize that in quantiles, and then we do the. Yes. Yeah, so, well, in, internally, we never like you know the real data gets used, but for the splitting, we do it within quantiles. Right. Well, if you have any other questions, come on up and ask me. Uh, but thank you for coming and uh, sticking around for a while. Thanks.